is lovely, Kotini Dimiruli, who holds a BA from Athens and an MA from Durham in English Literature and her DPhil in Comparative Literature from Oxford University. Her thesis entitled Gavati Hero, Literary Preparations and Cultural Projections of the Poet in English and American Literature, engaged with the politics of textual dissemination and cultural legitimization that underpinned C.P. Gavati's rising literary celebrity during the 20th century. A revised version of her doctoral dissertation is forthcoming as a monograph by Oxford University Press. Fotini's research interests lie in the fields of Greek, English, and American literature, as well as their intersections during the modernist period. She currently holds a postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton University, but will be taking up a junior research fellowship at Keeble College, Oxford, as of August 2017. Today she'll be speaking on Democracy in Crisis, the New York Review of Books, Aesthetics of Descent. Second. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Katerina, for hosting me and for inviting me. Um, so I think I, I come from a different position, in a way, to everybody else, in the sense that I'm a, I study literature, so I'm a literary scholar. Uh, but I have always seen my discipline as framed by social, historical, and political considerations. And this is the direction that actually mobilized my interest in the New York Review of Books. And it's in its history with respect to Greece, and more specifically with respect to the Greek junta. So, in particular, in my study of C. P. Kavafi, that Katerina mentioned, and um, with respect to his appropriation in both England and America, I turned to the discursive frameworks and the cultural milieus in which the poet's rising acclaim uh, was generated. I realized during that process that there was a dissenting intellectual and cultural climate at play in the production of Kavaf celebrities in America, during and shortly after the Junta in Greece. And this motivated me to further research uh, the journal's coverage of the Greek dictatorship. I will provide a brief overview before getting into the archive of the New York Review of Books um, on how this connection actually came about. So the event most crucial um, in the transfers of the interest in Kavafi from Britain to America uh, was the poet W.H. Auden, which many of you may be familiar with, and his emigration from Britain to the States, along with the subsequent uh, authoring of the introduction to the first publication of Kavafi's collected volume of poetry in America in 1961. That was the date when the, the collection came out. So the introduction by Auden induced a wave of interest in Kavafi's poetry. Its independent publication by the Atlantic Monthly also made an impression. As Auden was less bashful compared to his predecessors, with respect to the homoerotic content of Kavafi's poetry, and in Auden's papers, held at Austin, Texas, I discovered correspondence uh, between the Atlantic Monthly and the scandalized reader, who claimed that key cultural figures, such as Auden, should not be reinforcing the corrupting effect of Kavafi's poetry, which threatened to convert American children to homosexuality. Uh, the letter rehearsed a number of cliches to that direction, and unsurprisingly was met with a cutting response by the journal's editors. Such reactions point to the fact that Auden was already widely recognizable in America. His endorsement of immoral tendencies perceived as potentially dangerous precisely because his sponsorship was recognized as influential. Amongst literary circles, Auden's work uh, had widespread traction, particularly amongst, amongst the left-leaning and liberal sectors of the intelligentsia. Both his poetics and politics rendered him, for many, and increasingly over the 50s and 60s, a refreshing alternative to the conservative modernism of uh, Eliot and Pound. Uh, as a critic examining Auden's position within the cultural establishment put it, he became for an entire generation of American poets, quote, a totem of thinking dissent, in the framework of the disillusionment that ensued after World War II, and which also became pertinent to Cold War politics and to the debacle of the Vietnam War. Amongst the poets working under the spell of Auden and his influence, Stephen Spender, who is a younger member of the Bloomsbury Group and a literary promoter, famously he, he mostly talked about how he was a poet rather than actually writing poetry, uh, George, Joseph Brodsky, who was a political exile from Russia, expelled in 1972 and awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in, uh, in 1987. And James Merrill, uh, who was an American poet who spent a large portion of his life in Greece, all proceeded to write essays on Kavafi over the 60s and 70s. Many connecting links exist amongst these authors. 
the interconnectedness of the ties they forged in Kavafi's name rested largely on the impact of Odin's stamp of approval, on the networks of mutual support, on their links to the liberal Bloomsbury group within which Kavafi's reputation had flourished earlier on, on their interest in the Hellenic continuum, and in most cases on sexual orientation. But there was something beyond these factors that provided their essays on Kavafi with a common, distinct feel. In all of them, Kavafi's poetry was pitched in terms of anti-establishment politics and of the humanitarian value of counter-canonical voices, much like the argument run for Odin himself. Spender, Brodsky, and Merrill all published their essays in the New York Review of Books. Um, that's why I should, I should be sitting here. Here they are. Uh, in the New York Review of Books. And while today they figure prominently as the American cohort most tied to the dissemination of Kavak's overseas fame, the role that the review itself played as a publication venue with its own aims and agendas and which bound these conceptually aligned essays together during and after the junta in Greece has not been examined. The review may have been launched as a literary review but a volatile intellectual landscape shifting under the pressure of acute political challenges during the late 60s, affected a series of protean transformations of the journal's identity from a belle lettre respite to a radical left-wing medium committed to surveying the US's domestic and foreign policy. So in a sense, uh, when it was first um, uh, launched in 1963, uh, the, the mentality behind the review was that America didn't have anything equivalent to the London Review of Books or to this kind of European literary review that was very thorough and concise and, and, and interesting. So while it was created with this in mind, uh, at the dawn of the Vietnam War, it increasingly started weaving uh, current America, uh, American affairs into the more traditional genre of the book review. So it, it's a sort of a hybrid sort of writing emerged that became increasingly politicized. The question that emerged for me was therefore this. How did the review's ideologically distinct take on Greek literature fit within the bigger picture of the fraught question of American politics? The, it, the review was systema systematically engaged with this, and, how, and I was further interested in how these manifested themselves in America's uh, um, interference in Greek issues and on the way the review viewed this whole process. In an attempt to sum up the review's identity within the political climate of his time, Timothy Garton Ash, in an essay celebrating the journal's 50th anniversary in 2013, described it as a lighthouse, shedding its enlightenment beams upon the Western world. Its contributors, he contended, resembled a republic of letters. There were voices of rebellion, a writerly community from the East and the West sharing a dissident view of the world and standing united against the establishment. <coughs> Garden Ash's essay began with a reference to Chomsky. Here it is. It was a bright, cold day in 1984, and a conservative American friend was berating me about my article in the New York Review. How dare I even think of comparing US policy in Central America and Soviet policy in Central Europe? What kind of whining Chomsky-esque relativist had I become? We were just beginning a long car journey. I was his prisoner. On and on went the interrogation. The opening reference to Chomsky here is telling. It reflects the ways in which the linguist and philosopher became emblematic of the rift affected within the American intellectual scene and which their in which the review had forged its allegi uh, allegiances. Chomsky's piece, The Responsibility of Intellectuals, formed the special supplement um, of one of the review's 1969 issues. Um, and in this piece, which became the backdrop of Chomsky's major study, American Power and the New Mandarins, the philosopher was at work to expose the complicity of the American intelligentsia in the face of the country's criminal foreign politics. Chomsky's argument, by and large, runs thus. U.S. foreign politics are motivated by interest in capital and profit and the expansion of the military market. The case-by-case -case legitimization of uh, America's overseas aggressions that many intellectuals resort to while working under the aegis of privately funded institutions in the CIA and appealing to Cold War-fueled ideals, notably America's much revered attachment to democracy and freedom, masked the dangerous agendas surrounding the Vietnam War. 
Uh, and, as Chomsky put it, quote, the many Vietnams that inevitably lie, unquote. So in many ways, uh, Chomsky's arguments reflect uh, Njovi's, uh, the, the sort of argument that unraveled, um, that, that the one that you described before, about a certain um, moralizing tendency on the one side of the spectrum and other people rationalizing, you know, on a case-by-case basis. Um, uh, so Greece was in many ways a case in point for Chomsky's argument, for it did not fall un un under the rubric of the communist threat. Rather, it was a right-wing coup, and it was therefore improbable that a convincing argument of military support, which was a contested issue for both the Johnson and Nixon administrations, could be made on the basis of a crusade to defend democratic values. And yet it was, but uh, Chomsky would say that this is just not a position you can defend. While Chomsky mentioned Greece only in passing in this text, the prefacing quote of a later piece, rehearsing pretty much the same ideas, made direct reference to the Greek junta in relation to American interventions. This was borrowed, the prefacing quote, from Philip Raab's 1967 essay, The Year of the Coup d'Etat, called Left Face, a book review that highlighted the continuity between domestic American interest, the market, and foreign, foreign diplomacy. And this is the quote. So it would seem that our repeated interventions, covert and overt, in Latin America and elsewhere, are brutal assault on the Vietnamese people, not to mention our benign inattentiveness to the abolition of democracy in Greece by a few crummy colonels wholly dependent on American arms and loans, are all mere accidents, or mistakes perhaps. So this is an ironic take on it, that obviously it's not a mistake or an accident, but uh, it's making a point uh, on how people are ready to override this uh, private in uh, this vested interest that America had in um, meddling in foreign politics. Uh, at the time when the review was at the epicenter of the ideological upheaval induced by Chomsky's special supplement with the New York-based intellectual circles, a number of pieces constellating around Greece were published in the journal. These reflected the review's generic evolution and the discursive margin it secured for polemical opinion writing. The situation in Greece was addressed firstly in long review pieces, what may be termed a think piece, so this is a hybrid genre which brings together literary journalism and news coverage in writings uh, expertly moving from the specific to the general. Um, sorry, uh, I lost my, my page, that's a problem reading from a computer. Um, uh, and secondly, as part of the lively letter section, which is to this day a trademark of the journal's willingness to host interventions and heated debates. The Washington Post actually described it as the closest thing the intellectual world has to burn, burn knuckle boxing, uh, this was the letter section of the New York Review Books. In terms of content, the pieces on Greece followed the course that scholars working on American overseas diplomacy have routinely outlined. They moved from moderate considerations of the situation at hand, which also factored internal culpability and maybe apathy, as well as the precarity of the Greek political scene, to an increasingly vehement focus on human rights and of American complicity in their overseas violations. The gradual shift of focus upon the turn of the decade toward humanitarian concerns has been commonly associated with the de-escalation of civil rights struggles in a domestic level and with the pressures applied by lobbyists and different ethnic, ethnic groups in America on the back of the shared acknowledgement of the dire repercussions of the Vietnam War and of the acknowledgement of America's complici complicity in overseas suffering. My research in the New York Review of Books pieces published on Greece suggests that the coverage of the coup by the journal roughly followed this, the same pattern. The first piece allocated was in fact a letter by a lecturer at the University of Santa Barbara. And um, it was called Mina Savas and he said this letter to the editor, this is the first piece to come out with respect to the junta uh, in the review. And uh, by and large the argument that he rehearses is that there is a crime of silence committed when it comes to Greece. It seems that intellectuals are not really concerned with the fact that writers are imprisoned and tortured and that everybody turns their attention to anti-communist writers, for example, in Russia, which seem to be more interesting and intriguing in cases. However, by doing so, we forget our debt to the mother of democracy. This is kind of a common topos that will keep being rehearsed throughout, you know, this irony of, you know, the, the, 
um, the demise of uh, democracy at its very birthplace. Uh, uh, at that time, no long pieces on Greece had appeared yet. Uh, and the first long piece uh, appeared um, well, just only a bit later, later, and it was called Letter of Greece. Ronald Steele was a travel writer for the review, uh, notoriously neutral in his political affiliation, uh, surprisingly too for the review, and he wrote what we would call trouble spot pieces. So he also wrote a letter from Oakland and a letter from Havana, uh, addressing the, the situation in Cuba. Uh, so he wrote this uh, piece early on. He talked of the co colonels as unsophisticated provincials and of the junta as a plague. Uh, yet at the same time, he still retained a certain level of uh, skepticism. And he said that there is, seems to be internal apathy in Greece because junta brings um, a promise to boost the economy and maybe to end the old corrupt parliamentary game. That's a quote from the text itself. Uh, of course, uh, after this article, letters were published in the, in the review where many protested against the article. Um, the, uh, there was a particular uh, letter writer who said it's unfair of Steele to as assume in a way that the Greeks brought it upon themselves, uh, that brought the coup uh, uh, amongst themselves <coughs> by, 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 through this entire like, conflict between left, right and the king. Uh, and other, there was actually another letter that ties to Dimitris' paper later on, which said that it's, um, one should say that the junta is a fascist regime, because if we sort of pretend that it's a different variation, we give it a unique sort of uh, aura that it doesn't intrinsically have. So there were a lot of reactions published, I don't have time to get into them now. Um, uh, but it is interesting that... Um, uh, the, the, uh, while Steele's piece was keen to give, in a way, the colonists the benefit of the doubt, moving towards the 70s, the review was in fact pioneering in disregarding skepticism toward the employment of torture practices and in exposing the inhuman aspects of the junta while decisively linking it to the troubling puzzle of America's expansionist project. This was happening at the same time when American strategists attempted, attempt, attempted a balancing act on the one hand, to renounce the regime's methods while safeguarding the political stability and order that would serve the nation's Cold War agenda. If early accounts of the junta approached the coup as a culmination of subtle manifestations of both Greek and Western state oppression, a gradual shift took place after 1969, as the news of the regime's censorship, political detentions, and torture practices attracted international attention. Increasingly thereafter, reactions to the dictatorship in, G in Greece served to bolster the unforgiving accounts of Western imperialism outlined by influential contributors, while rendering the country one of the crucial milieus in which human rights violations became a major concern for American people and their government. In 1967, the Amnesty International Secretariat in London commissioned an investigation of the Greek government's announced amnesty for political prisoners. The report, authored by two attorneys and published in uh, 1968, made mention of torture, quote, as a widespread practice, which was employed deliberately and officially by the junta. However, despite listing 18 techniques of torture, the report provided insufficient substantiation for its claims, which rendered it vulnerable to skepticism and even accusations of propaganda. The incredulity the report inspired among sectors of conservative readers and, of course, junta sympathizers, as well as the Greek government's consistent attempt to undermine its findings, did not deter the review from publishing a letter authored by the Amnesty which made claim to human rights violation and to, quote, the unspeakable treatment of political prisoners by the present Greek government. So this was all happening while there was still a very strong current against those claims of torture practices and against the uh, amnesty claims. Uh, so this is the Amnesty International's letter, which was protesting, actually, a piece that came out um, in the New York Times and which was a promotional supplement, supplement promoting tourism in Greece. So the argument here ran that, you know, uh, it's probably the junta funding this promotional supplement. You wouldn't, during the Second World War, 
uh, publish an equivalent article about the merits of sunny Bavaria. You know, it's an equivalent situation. Uh, how can you override the torture happening at a wide scale torture and uh, censorship practices um, to, uh, and publish this kind of piece? Uh, however, the New York Times uh, declined to publish the protest. So it was in the review that it was eventually hosted. And this is the, um, this is the piece that they're referring to. Here we can see Greece, the coming country, which is also the title of the protest. And you've got these titles, Night and Day, the beauty of Greece dazzles the senses. So you can see the discrepancy between, you know, this sort of supplement and um, the, the kind of uh, the awareness of what was going on in Greece amongst uh, sort of section of uh, liberal intellectuals that were writing for the review. Um, so, um, so the Times decision to proceed with a promotional supplement despite widespread awareness of, quote, the bestialities being committed in the prisons and concentration camps of Greece, provided those preaching the Western difference with further ammunition. And while the review's response to the situation could have at the time reasonably been considered biased, in the context of the journal's ideological affiliations, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe resolution to make public the report of the Human Rights Commission on the Greek case on, in April 1970 validated, through a rigorous and evidence-based report, the amnesty's earlier allegations of torture taking place in Greek prisons. The report, which had first been leaked in December 1969, found the Greek government guilty of violating most of the basic articles of the European Human Rights Convention, the compliance with which was also the condition of the country's membership as part of the Council of Europe. Enabled by both the amnesties and the European <coughs> Commission of High Human Rights Reports, the review proceeded to publish first-hand testimonies by those directly affected by the regime. This editorial direction was in keeping with the escalation of human rights concerns during the 70s, in which context, quote, tales of torture became a nascent liberal human rights coalition's most effective tool in mobilizing public opposition to the Greek junta and more broadly in U.S. strategies for fighting the Cold War. In 1970, the review published the first piece written under a <coughs> pseudonym. And this is the piece. So... It's translated by Edward Wharton, but it's the writer is the author is why it's called Greece: Cultural Freedom in the Gangster State. <coughs> so the main argument um, rehearsed uh, in this uh, piece is uh, the the, uh, the grim observations on the loss of uh, civil liberties, press censorship, but also uh, an uh, analysis of uh, the faltering cultural life and on the effect this could have on education and especially on the younger generations. Um, so it provided this very grim picture, and uh, there's a quote that is particularly depressing from this article called "After Lib uh, that's, that goes um, after liberty and hope, there is little left to lose." So um, <coughs> shortly after, a second piece came under a different pseudonym from Z, who pretty much affirmed what Y had said but also added that probably uh, why it was too generous in not pinpointing America's complicity. So for Z, um, well, what should be further emphasized was the polarization created in the Greek political scene by Cold War politics and the extent to which the systematic hostility toward liberal and left-wing movements and ideas cultivated by the NATO had nourished the coup. In the same year, the review also published another letter by Alexander Panagoulis, a young Greek who three years earlier tried to assassinate the dictator George Papadopoulos, and uh, this had been smuggled out of prison and forwarded to the journal's editors. The letter appeared in the review under the title Vi Vietnamizing Greeks, which with its wording openly framing the Greek culture be beyond local socio-historical particularities and as part of a series of infamous American agendas of foreign intervention. While um, the government's efforts to eradicate opposition to the regime through censorship, imprisonment, and exile were not unprecedented, news from Greece served as an additional reminder of the silencing of Greek intellectuals, as well as of the West's comparative freedom to speak out against repressive and tyrannical measures. The issue of the West's complicity, compli West's complicity was cast as a key concern by, key, by, by the review's contributors 
who set both the narrative freedom afforded by the think piece and the radical politics to which the review subscribed to the service of exploring the responsibility of the modern intellectual. The importance of intellectual intervention was actually also highlighted in Wise's uh, piece. And he made mention to Seferis, to Yoros Seferis, the poet, and to the courage uh, that his uh, anti-junta proclamation entailed in 1969. Both in Greece and abroad, Seferis was heroized as a mouthpiece of anti-junta sentiment due to the broadcasted condemnation of the dictatorship. And this was very much the case in the review too. Yet it has been suggested that Seferis' statements were not as spontaneous as they appeared and that there was some pressure applied to mobilize the state statement from him. However, the image crafted in the review for Seferis was akin to that of a poet activist. An illustration which was in keeping with the review's prioritizing of the category of the rebel thinker or the ideal of the public intellectual and which was readily accommodated within the radical and perhaps even anti-American discourse of the new left. In 1971, after Seferis' funeral, a few seminal contributors to the review created a plea for fundraising to aid the families of political prisoners persecuted by the regime, while celebrating within the text of the plea his dissident ideological affiliations and, of course, at the same time making a statement against the junta. And this is the plea published again in the review as everything. And you can see the contributors, the three very famous writers and intellectuals, Isaiah Berlin, uh, Iris Murdoch, William Plummer, Stephen Spender, many of them also had connections to Greece. So this was a plea to help uh, political prisoners in the name of Sefes. Um, so far as authors such as Kavafi and Sefes, both writing in Greece, lent their voices to an outlook on American politics gone wrong, they also enhanced the journal's fearless rhetoric, which employed marginality and subalternity to challenge the ways in which the U.S. had, had utilized its cultural and political dominance. Of course, as almost every meeting point between the lofty and the aesthetic and the worldly, the review was not immune to accusations of hypocrisy. Tom Wolfe famously labeled it an organ of the, quote, radical chic, populated by an elite that could afford to be moralizing through the cushioning of privilege in academic positions and by remaining uninvolved in the struggles of grassroots movements. Steiner's response to Chomsky's piece signposts a few of those concerns. Here, you rightly say that we are all responsible. You <coughs> rightly hint that our future status may be no better than that of the aqueous, aqu aquescent, aquescent, I don't know, intellectual under uh, nas nas Nazism. But what action do you urge or even suggest? Will Noam Chomsky announce that he will stop teaching at MIT or anywhere in this country so long as torture and napalm go on? The intellectual is responsible. What then shall he do? I do not ask in order to make it a better point, but in deep personal perplexity. Does your essay not stop almost at the point where it ought to begin? So Chomsky responds to this, and he says that he has done whatever he can. He's a lobbyist, he's an activist. He doesn't agree with MIT's principles, but he doesn't think that by leaving the country and stopping, you know, uh, not fighting anymore, he can affect more change than if he stays put. Um, so yeah, that's an, I think that's a very cliché sort of correspondence, but it's still interesting when it comes to, to, to these questions. Uh, even more pointedly, allegations of complicity of intellectual with the intelligence services, voiced by one of the founders of the review himself in a piece entitled The CIA and the Intellectuals, on occasion, perhaps unwittingly, even targeted the review's contributors. For example, Steve, Stephen Spender, who launched the periodical Encounter, which uh, in 1967 was exposed to be receiving covert funding by the CIA. Spender is the person who made the, cl the plea in the name of Seferis, who also wrote about Kabafi from this anti-establishment perspective, and yet, you know, Spender said he didn't know that he was being funded by the CIA. But I recently visited the archives in Oxford, and it's quite clear that he was turning a blind eye from their letters. Um, in this sense, uh, Garden Ash is perhaps over-optimistic in his celebration of undivided community of revolutionary writers. However, even with these dynamics at play, the review was not only pivotal in shining light on America's Cold War obsessions, but was also unique in linking the literary production of a marginal country with a response to contemporary events. It's, center, it's centered around Greek literary figures and their work, 
as a medium to explore lessons to be learned or to highlight what political art may mean as a challenge to the canonical, the dominant and the authoritarian. A study conducted in 1971 found that the review's influence by far outweighed any, that of any other major magazine amongst an elite educated readership. Indeed, the review swiftly dominated the cultural sphere, with the byline in the journal becoming the ultimate marker of recognition for the erudite late 20th century intellectual and critic, uh, rendering it the golden standard of cultural importance <coughs> for journalists, scholars, and academics around the world. Given this popularity and strong cultural presence, it can be safely assumed that the review, so long as it remained engaged with the Junta in Greece, had significant impact on shaping public opinion about it, and importantly, on projecting a local overseas predicament on the screen of global politics and American manipulations. Let us have a look, as a closing sort of thing, at an indicative quote in this respect from a 1976 piece entitled Intelligence, the Constitution Betrayed. Uh, to deny the people knowledge of what the government does is to deny them the ability to pass judgment on its conduct, and thus to make a mockery of the democratic process. If recent administrations had respected this elementary principle, we might have avoided the Bay of Pigs, war in Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, and alienation of much of world opinion by our, Ill, our ill-considered interventions in the internal affairs of Greece, Portugal, Chile, and many other countries. This is again from the review. Despite these failures, still Comager noted, the review, amongst a few other journals, consistently sought, quote, to focus public interest on issues of principle, unquote. Indeed, with the publication of anonymous letters, the celebration of authors stifled by the Greek junta, and the immersion of Greek politics and literature in an arena committed to expose exploitative global, global politics, the journal was a major channel of political and literary discussions moving in the direction of resistance. By offering a new discursive array, arena for intellectuals of the Vietnam War era to test state-produced justifications for military interve interventions and to broach global humanitarian crisis, the review's coverage not only of the Greek dictatorship but also of the Greek literary scene served on the one hand to exemplify the vice of American imperialism and on the other to bolster the journal of dissenting view during the late 60s and early 70s. And while the Greek dictatorship did not figure prominently amongst the investigative reportages populating the review's pages, I do believe its archive with respect to Greece is significant for lending its weight to a set of broader concerns preoccupying the left and which constellated around the decline of human rights, the repetitive history of violence and oppression, and the position of intellectuals amidst the bleak realities of the modern world. Thank you very much. <laughs>